I've not been beat that much on that, so a game of one-on-one -on -one or 2v2 two will be uh, next on the agenda, I think. Welcome to the Leeds United Show. This week we're going to be looking back on the controversial match at Crystal Palace, catching up with the under-23s head coach Mark Jackson on life in the new role and getting the perspective from the women's team with their skipper, Bridie Hannon. First of all, though, let's begin with the weekend's loss at Palace, Ben. Disappointing game with a huge talking point, that wasn't it? Oh, yeah, just just ever so slightly a huge talking point. But the goal the goal and the game in the context of everything just was, wasn't our best. Didn't start well, and that's not like because we usually start games really well. You can see here with Crystal Palace getting getting the early goal. The disappointing thing, you can see two of our guys, two centre-halves in the middle, and it's, it's Scott Dan. He gets the kind of a free header. Great finish, by the way. Comes off crossbar, Melier, no chance. Yeah, we're leading to that kind of talking point. We'll go into that a bit later on. The um, the key thing there, get back 1-1. One, one. Who knows what, what game it, it could be. But um, that was definitely a massive talking point. Just not only at Leeds United, but across football as well. The reaction to it's been absolutely huge. But what Crystal Palace did well, they got the ball forward to really good areas. We know they've got some great attacking threats. And Eze, he was a player who really impressed me last season at QPR. I thought he's a, fa a fantastic talent. But we responded well, 2-0 down. Again, a great team goal by us. Patrick Bamford, yeah, might have the disappointment after not letting the goal through VIR, the first one. I have to say, fantastic finish. Chest volley into the bottom corner. You're kind of thinking at this stage, can we go in at half-time? Just that 2-1 deficit gives us something to kind of work towards the second half. But just another free goal, really. So all the free goals for Crystal Palace for me in the first half, two off the crossbar and that free cone goal. And you give yourself a massive hill to climb then we've seen against Leicester with that two goal margin trying to get back into the game you always get goals like this where we're trying to push getting bodies forward there's always going to be gaps and as we've seen already in the Premier League the teams have got the most quality they, they will hurt you yeah we tried to keep pushing we're always going to do that we're not going to throw the towel in we know the players always give 100% right to the very end half a chance there for Patrick Bamford miscued his header Rafinha was a player who came on at half time. I thought he was really sharp, really impressed by him. So I'm sure he'll be pushing to start the, the, the next game after the international break. That free kick just goes wide. But overall, probably a result and a performance just didn't justify us to get the three points. I mean, you mentioned there that it isn't just Leeds United fans um, who've been talking about the decision, but it's been everywhere. So let's hear what the man himself, Patrick Bamford, had to say about that decision. I don't understand the rule. I think that you can't score with your arm it'd be given handball so why if your arm's offside is that it's not a part of your body you can score with so it doesn't make sense and obviously that's happened today with me but I've seen it happen on numerous occasions to other players recently and I think it's ruining football isn't it I mean you want to see goals and to have it denied for something like that I think it's daft it seems to me you were pointing where you want the yeah. ball to be played and as a result you know, a bit of armpit is offside. I've only just seen it back now. And um, I remember on the start of the second half, I said to the ref, why was it given offside? And he said, oh, your arm. I was like, really? And he's like, so even he didn't, couldn't make any sense of it. So it's tough when, when the players and the officials can't make sense of it, then it, does it really make sense? So let's look at that decision again then, Ben. You could maybe argue that it is the right call, but it doesn't really feel like it's within the spirit of the game, does it? Not one bit. And it says it all when Patrick Bamford, the striker, the guy who's actually playing in the game, just says it's wrong. He doesn't really un they understand the rules of the players, the uh, saying about the referee there. Why did he get disallowed on the referee? kind of shrugging his shoulders about a handball. And the build-up to the play is fantastic. And you look at Patrick Bamford's movement, it comes back on side and... The freeze frame here, you're seeing what you get taught as a eight, nine, ten year old striker, point where you want to receive the ball. And that's what it has done. So if to be given offside, if you want to go to the very letter of the law, it might be yeah, it might be classed as offside that, but we can't have that in football. If you look at that and someone's saying to me that is offside, not not one bit, not a chance. For one, the camera angle's not even in line, so how you kind of guess in there. And there's a lot of human error that always goes into into these little things. And for me, the technology got brought in to eradicate human error, but human error still exists. Exactly. So I don't I don't know where we stand with it, to be honest. And you look at it as well. Even even the defenders, they aren't flinching when that goal goes in. They're just assuming that's a goal. Well, hundred percent. And you know, as a defender, I've, I've been there where you just get those little hunches where you think, yeah, he's offside. No, he, no, he's actually onside. Someone's dropped in and played him on. But as I said Patrick Bams has done everything right. Everything you tell a young striker, even a senior striker as well, the movement to come back on side and then to point where you want the ball and running onto it. Look, 
for me, talking about VAR, before VAR, VAR came in, there's always discussions Sunday, Monday, Tuesday about decisions within a game. We're still talking about the same things with the technology. So for me, it's not working at all. And this is just not us being biased because we're obviously connected to the club. This is, for me, it's across the whole game. If this was another team, for example, and it happened to those guys, I'd be saying exactly the same thing. It is ruining the game. Well, I think that has been echoed far and wide. It's not just Leeds United fans that have said that. But do you think the problem with VAR, Ben, is that it's almost too clinical? Massively, massively. And for me, it was always brought in like the, um, the human error kind of aspect of it all. But if there's a major kind of incident and it's a massive error, that's what we brought in to eradicate those decisions where it's like, is that a massive human error or an error by the linesman? No. And I still look at that, I'm still, I'm still baffled how it got disallowed. So, look, I, I were kind of lucky not to play in an era with VAR. So for the players now, it must be so difficult. And he's, you're right, I mean, it's becoming too clinical. Just have the major decisions because every finer detail, every single goal is getting scrutinised. And what's the game about? What we love about? It's about goals, scoring plenty of goals. So to chalk a goal off like that, fantastic build-up play, great pass from Mateus Click, fantastic finish from Patrick Bamford. So for a goal like that to be ruled out, it's just not working, VAR. And you mentioned as well, Ben, that you're glad that you weren't playing in a time with it. It was a long time ago, wasn't it? But, um, <laughs> I mean, even like coming out and hearing the players saying that the rules are unclear and they're uncertain, that doesn't give spectators much confidence if the people on the pitch don't know what's going on. Well, they've already changed the handball rule from yeah. start of the season up until now. So I can envisage a few more changes happening as of course the season goes on. And to me, that's just wrong. So you start a season with a, with a set of rules, adhere to those from beginning to end, even if people don't like them, don't have the inconsistency of changing because like you say, players are turning up to games, they don't know the rules. And what, what kind of sport do you know where the, the players, the most important people about a particular sport, don't know the rules? And it's just unbelievable that we've got into this stage, the technology. And the technology always gets compared to probably the rugby. And the, uh, the volumes of, of, of money, resources involved in football compared to rugby, it's, it's tenfold compared to what rugby have. But rugby have nailed it. They, they can get it absolutely spot on. Whereas we're pumping all the money, loads of sponsors in around VAR, and we get decisions like that. It, like I say, it's just completely wrong. I know you say almost stick with the rules, you know, and only change them, say, at the end of the season or something, so everyone knows where they stand. But you see decisions like that and you go, actually, surely things do need to change. So in your opinion, or your opinion, what does need to change with VAR? <laughs> Scrap it. <laughs> can, can, <laughs> can, we, can we do that? No, but like I said, like, you're speak, speaking about VA, uh, post, uh, pre, pre VAR, where there's always the human error, like, like I'm saying. So they brought it in to just eradicate that, that completely. So to like, so be very clinical. So they're wanting 100% decisions correctly. We're not getting that. So for me, I just go and look at the, if it's a goal or not goal line technology and not scrutinize every single decision because it took quite an age to get to that decision. There's been a host of other occasions where the referee goes over, looks at the monitor now, and it's just killing the tempo of the game. Slows it all down. It's it? I don't know because no fans are in the stadium, but it does make makes as a, as a viewer watching on TV, the products just it's not as great as it is as it can be. Well, that's because part of the joy of watching the game and playing the game is the celebration. And when that gets cut off midway through while everyone has to wait patiently, it kills it a bit. And I've seen a few fans after the game saying, I actually missed the championship because at least a goal gets scored, you can celebrate yeah. it. So <laughs> You can jump up and down freely, <laughs> yeah, can't you? That's probably the only part you do miss about the championship, yeah. by the way. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's, um, that, that's, like I said, that's the joy. That's why... People play grassroots, hundreds of thousands, millions of kids growing up all over the country play grassroots football because they want to score goals. They don't want to be a left back like me, defending, blocking crosses, heading balls clear. They play up and down parks, the parents take them, the brothers, the sisters, grandparents, whoever, put jumpers down for goalposts because they want to score. So you're getting these decisions, you're taking away the joy from the game and that, that's not non. Um, I mean, VAR aside, now we'll move on, because it has been, you know, a tough couple of games. Do you think injuries have played their part in that? Oh, huge. 
you. So you take example the the game against Crystal Palace and just two players in particular, Calvin Phillips and Rodrigo. Automatically, that's majority of your spine of your team, and you take your spine away where one's an England international and one's a Spanish international. Two high quality players who dare I said fit into most Premier League teams of course you're going to miss them and you go any other team up or down the country you take away their best players they are they are going to feel it within the within the lineup so look it has, it has affected us a little bit I think the players who've come in they've, they've done well I expect them to do that because they know the roles and responsibilities but it'll be interesting to see when we come back next to next fixture against Arsenal can we have these players available? I'm hoping so, because it just makes us stronger, that's all. Do you think these are kind of lessons learned in the Premier League that you can't give too many chances away? Yeah, we, we are learning lessons. We, we've always said that. We'll learn as we go ahead in this campaign. But you can't keep saying, oh, it's another lesson learned. We'll learn for the next game, because <laughs> you might be 10, 12 games down the line and you're still thinking, oh, we need another lesson learned. So the players are fully aware of that. A lot have been talk about conceding the, the, the eight goals in the last two games. Yeah, albeit there's been some great finishes, there's been a bit of uh, unlucky moments on our part as well. Again, you get that in football. But I'm sure the boys will be working ever so hard when they do come back after international break to just rectifying that because it's not individual, it's just probably more of a collective. And we always kind of say we defend from the front, so it does start from Patrick Bamford. We know he works his socks off, so as a collective unit, can we just position ourselves correctly just to maybe fill in some gaps where players might be maybe hurting us at the moment? Well, the table makes things look as wide open as they are. What have you thought to the start of the season overall, Ben? I've enjoyed it. Yeah. I've, I've, I've loved being back in the Premier League. Don't, don't get me wrong. You enjoy it more when you win. But, yeah. but we know we're not going to win every single game because we'll be where Leicester, Tottenham, Liverpool are at the moment. And word on, word on Leicester, we, we saw him here at Ellen Road on the Monday Night Football. I thought they were a really good outfit. That's the best team I've seen has played live so far this season. I thought they were really well drilled. But as you can see, we find ourselves in 15th place. And I think Mateus Klitsch come out and said, yeah, we've probably got a few pats on the back through his performances, how we play, but they, they'd like more points on the board. But to be fair, it's, it's just one, it's one of those. I think a lot of groups of teams so far in the Premier League it's the same situation as us, done, done well in parts, can improve in others. And it's going to be a season like that, but as long as we just keep remaining to ourselves what we like to do, our philosophy closing down, working hard, don't change because you have a couple of um, bad 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 results you're going to get that throughout the course of the season but focus on the positives and just tweak a little bit a few of those negatives as well now on the Leeds United show we are joined by the Leeds United's women captain and my very good friend Bridie Hammond hi Bridie hello how are you yes I'm very good thank you for having me thanks for joining us right before we get stuck into what's been going on with the women's team uh, the men's team obviously we've been chatting about that what are your thoughts on the well the start of the season really um, do you know, I've been really, really proud with how they've conducted themselves since they've moved up to the Premier League. Um, I think we've been unfortunate recently with a couple of the results. Um, I think what's fascinating to see is how, um, you know, the possession that they're having against the top teams in the league is just incredible. And I think I heard the other day that there was a stat like there's no team uh, last year that matched. I think it was Liverpool. Um, but yeah. Little old Leeds United have come up to the Premier League and uh, we're absolutely bossing it in terms of possession. But um, yeah, it's a shame. Obviously, we've conceded a few goals recently, uh, which has obviously knocked us down the league table. But I think we'll be all right this year. And it's obviously, of course, our first season experience in VAR. What have been your thoughts on it? I'm, I'm a little bit mixed, to be fair. Um, I liked the fact that it was introduced because I thought that decisions were, were going to be made that was correct and there was nothing worse um, than before VAR when decisions that were made that were wrong. Um, but the handball um, at the weekend with Patrick Bamford was just, it was just it was incredible, really, as to why his goal got uh, marked offside because of his hand. So that, in a, in a sense, is really frustrating. And I think what you see now is when people score goals, the first thing that they do is, is look over to the ref and the linesman to see if it's a goal. And I feel like that kind of stops the celebrations a little bit. And it must be really frustrating for the players um, you know, to, to, to be so uncertain as to whether it's a goal or not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if it's frustrating for us, almost going to celebrate and think how, how it must feel for them. Um, I mean, what's been pretty frustrating for you guys is that lockdown 2.0 now has halted your season. How are you feeling about that, you and the rest of the squad? It's really frustrating, to be honest with you. We've only played, I think, about five or six games. 
Um, and within that time, there's a couple of girls that have um, had to isolate. So it's been it's been quite difficult. I feel like we've not really got into the flow of things, really. Um, so to, to stop for at least a month is just really, really frustrating. And I think for me, I missed the first three games through injury. So I was so excited to get back into the swing of things. Um, and I finally did start putting in some good performances. And then the next thing, you know, obviously COVID happens and uh, obviously we're into another lockdown. And, you know, you've had a few uh, new signings. It must have been a bit of a weird time for them because this would ordinarily be the time when they'd be settling in and getting bedding into a new team. How have they got on under the current circumstances? I think they're fitting really well. I think there's some some really good personalities in there. Um, you know, they've given some really good feedback, really, in terms of how they're fitting as well. I think when you speak to the likes of uh, Laura and Aaliyah, um, you know, they said that all the girls are really friendly. They're fitting really well in the team with the managers and everything. You know, we all communicate quite frequently on like the WhatsApp groups and things like that. So, um, you know, the social side of things has been absolutely fine. I think it's just gelling as a team, which I think when there's a, when there's a new season, and you've got new new signings. There's always going to be um, that little bit of an embedding period. But it's just a shame that it's just so disjointed at the moment and we can't seem to get into the flow of things. So it must be frustrating for them um, because we'll play a couple of games and then we might have a week off due to COVID and things like that. And then we're back in again. And obviously now we've got a bit of a longer break. So, yeah, I don't feel like we've, we've fully gelled as a team yet. But um, in terms of the new players, I think there's definitely more to see from them. How long does it normally take for you to gel as a team when you get those new signings filtering in? It can take months, to be honest with you. It's, um, you know, you see, you see it quite a lot where where teams get a lot of new players in, and it's very rare that they'll just gel straight away. Um, it does take a little bit of time, and obviously with us, we we train twice a week and then play on a Sunday. Um, and, and like I say, a couple of the games have been have been cancelled, whether it be due to the weather or or due to teams not being able to field a team. Um, obviously, due to people isolating, so it can take months, and and I think it probably will take even longer, maybe this season. Have you had any uh, any socially distanced initiation ceremonies for him? We haven't. No, we haven't <gasps> done anything like that. But I feel like Friday. I should have kept him maybe organised this. Yeah, are you going to... Right, let's, th let's put you on the spot now. What kind of things... What did you have to do? How did you get initiated? Do you know, I don't think I did anything, but um, I know that when we used to go to away matches on the coach, we used to get the girls to buddy up and they used to have to sing a song. Um, and Frenchie and the team, she is an unbelievable singer. Um, so a lot of the girls just sang and he was kind of like, oh God, don't give up your day job. But Frenchie <laughs> was absolutely incredible. Um, but obviously, you know, that's, that's another thing. Some of the games this year, we've, we've drove to the games ourselves. Or when we've been on the coach, we've had to be sat kind of socially distanced with our masks on and we certainly wouldn't be able to get up and sing. So again, it's been a shame that the newbies haven't been able to do that. But I'm sure as and when that happens, we'll be getting them to do something similar. Can you please film it so we can put it on the Leeds United show? Of course, yeah. Um, now, obviously, <laughs> promotion is always the challenge every season. What are, what, what are your biggest challenges this season? Obviously, albeit an unorthodox one. I think um, I'd definitely said to keep the team um, kind of fit and, and healthy. Um, and I think, I know we keep talking about COVID and people isolating, but that's been a massive factor so far. Um, some of the kind of poor results that we've had recently, it's, it's, it's been due to the fact that we've had four or five players out, um, either injured or self-isolating. And I think when you've not played for a while and then you're coming back in and it is intense, like the training we do is intense and the matches are intense, that when you've not played for a while, that's how you can pick up injuries. Um, so I think for us, that's the biggest challenge. It's, it's to try and gain a little bit of consistency in, in terms of our fitness. Um, and this is why we're all trying to do things in our spare time to, to try and keep fit and healthy so that when the time comes and we can play again, that we're going to be ready to play. And hopefully we'll get that kind of gelling period where we can do that. Now, obviously, I know you, so I know the kinds of things that you have been getting up to, but just share with us how you do keep fit away from your teammates. Yeah, so one thing that we've utilised quite a lot is the Strava app, which is the running app. Um, so we get sent uh, three, three or four runs to do a week, uh, and they, they vary, to be honest. So this week we've got um, like a couple of three-mile runs, that we've got like a 40-minute run. Um, it, obviously, it can be quite difficult to, to juggle with work and things like that. And I think what makes it harder is the fact that the gyms are closed as well. So when some people are working till five o'clock, they're then having to go out in the rain and the cold and the dark and, and try and get one of these runs in. But we, we understand the importance of doing that because when, you know, we might not get that much notice when we, when we next play a match. So um, Strava runs, we're doing that and the coaches are keeping on top of who's actually doing the runs. Um, and then for me at the moment as well, I'm applying for the fire service, uh, which I don't know if you're aware of. Um, so, you know, some of the things I've been doing is extra weights that I wouldn't normally do, but um, I, I just need someone to practice doing a fireman's lift with, I think. <laughs> not my name myself. Um, <laughs> 
But, but also, do, do you like kind of build each other up? Because you're all training individually, but are you, are you in a WhatsApp group or is there anything that allows you to keep spurring each other on with that? I think we do have a WhatsApp group, but we, we use mainly that for social as opposed to spur, spurring each other on. Um, but I think the, the Strava app's really good because you follow each other and you can give each other like kudos and stuff like that. And I think you, you compare yourself with one another. So if someone's already done the run, say, for example, on a Monday night and you were plan, planning on doing you were on a Tuesday, I would try and compare myself to one of the other girls and try and beat them. And then if I do beat them, I'd probably give them a bit of banter about it. So, um, so yeah, that's how we motivate ourselves. I would be terrible at that because... You know, me running after about five minutes, I'd be like, <gasps> I give up. So I'd be like bottom of the pack every single time. So I think I'd, I'd avoid Strava, to be honest, Bride. Um, you know, I've never been into like running, but I've always obviously loved my football. But um, I, I have found a newfound love for running, to be honest, because, you know, it's pretty much all we can do at the moment. Um, and, and I actually really enjoy it. Yeah, can I kind of just throw it out there, we can also eat. I think the nation's divided we like 50-50. 50% <laughs> of them are running, 50% of them are eating, aren't we? So whatever you're doing that works for you, keep doing it. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you mentioned earlier, like, the commitments that you all have outside of it, because playing for the Leeds United women's team isn't a full-time thing for you, because it can't be. Um, this time with COVID must have really tested the commitment for a lot of you, having to juggle everything else around it. I actually think it's been easier. I think for myself working from home, um, I don't have that kind of travel time um, and getting ready for work kind of time. So, you know, for me, like tonight, I'm finishing work at six o'clock. I'm planning on going for a run. I'll be out the house for, for quarter past six. So it's actually made it easier to keep on top of my fitness working from home. Um, I know, again, you know, people that are furloughed, they've got more time. I've seen people posting things on Facebook and Instagram going for like random runs in, in the afternoon where they'd normally be working. Um, so I actually think it, it's in, in a way it's had a positive impact on that. Have you heard from any of the other girls, though, that maybe have struggled with it around this time? Yeah, I think um, I think Frenchie, because she's a, um, a teacher. Um, and like like I mentioned, you know, it's, it can be quite dangerous running on a night, especially when it's been, you know, raining throughout the day. And obviously it is quite dark. And depending on where you live and things like that, you might be limited uh, to the kind of routes. Uh, where I live is quite good, actually, for running. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of main roads and, and it, you know, the lighting's quite good and stuff like that. But I think Frenchie has struggled to try and get those runs in. Your back garden's big enough to do laps of as well, mate, so you're all right. <laughs> <aren't> you? <laughs> um, and you said, obviously, it could be quite short notice until you know when you're playing again. What's the latest on that, do you know? To be honest with you, I've not really heard a lot. Um, all we've been told is just to carry on doing these runs and, and, until we get that message to say that we're back up and running. Um, I imagine that we'll be allowed a couple of weeks training before you know we have our first match. I can't imagine that it would be a case of we get a text on Tuesday and you're playing on the Sunday. So I imagine that we'd have at least a couple of weeks um, to get some training before we play. But yeah, it's it, it's frustrating. That it's, it's the unknown, isn't it? You know, it could be after Christmas now. Um, so yeah, we've just got to keep on our air game. And obviously, you know, it's been well publicised that at grassroots level, there's boys and girls who know they aren't going to be playing for at least another few weeks. Um, what kind of advice would you give to them to keep that momentum, to keep the, the drive and keep going before they do start playing again? I think for me, it's, it's about keeping yourself, um, you know, mentally fit and, and healthy and well and you know, it might sound a bit cheesy, but actually sticking to all the government guidelines and things like that and, and don't put yourself at risk um, and where possible, you know, try and get your fitness in um, because if it, it's hard to lose, um, so it's easy to lose your fitness. Um, so I think just to carry on doing things day in, day out and, you know, you don't necessarily need to go for a run outside your house. You can do things in the house. There's lots of different workouts on YouTube and things like that. Um, and even for people that don't have gym equipment, you know, I've seen videos with people like lifting tins of beans and things like that. So, you know, there's so much you can do in your house using, you know, even just your sofa and things like that. Um, I don't mean sat down on the sofa, I mean actually doing something. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, like, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> Lay down on my sofa, that's not what I meant. Um, but yeah, so I'd definitely say just to, to try and keep yourself fit and healthy and ready uh, for when you get that text. Mark Jackson's dedication to Leeds United can't be underestimated. As a young pro, he learned his trade here, broke into the first team and returned as a coach in the academy. Enjoyed success with the under-18s before getting his chance to step up and take on the head coach role with the under-23s this season. Ben Parker spent some time catching up with Jacko to see how he's settling into his new role. Mark, it's obviously been a few months since we've seen each other, spoke to each other. How's everything going? Uh, yeah, it's going well. Uh, obviously, a ch change of role for me uh, from from the 18s to the 23s. Uh, it's been uh, it's, it's been a good transition for me. It's been a hectic time, 
uh, obviously transitioning up and with the current situation with, with, with the restrictions and COVID and things like that, there's uh, challenging aspects, but it's been really, really enjoyable. That's probably an overriding thing I get from you, enjoyable, but how did it come about? Uh, you know, Adam Underwood approached me. Uh, it was after, after uh, the EFL game with Accrington. Uh, and he said, you know, the, the club had been discussing uh, kind of a potential role for me with the 23s. And, you know, from, from my point of view, it was, uh, it, was a, it was an opportunity I couldn't turn down. You know, he's, I've, I've worked with the 18s for four years now, uh, come, come from, from the 16s to the 18s. So I've had four good years with the 18s. And that's kind of from, from my natural progression. And, my development as a, as, as a, as a coach, it, it seemed a good opportunity for me, which, which I didn't want to turn down and, you know, I was happy to, uh, to accept. In terms of the challenges that you face now being with the under-23s, obviously the obvious one for, for myself watching from the outside is the step up in quality and around the players who were around the first team a lot more. What, what, are, the, what are the challenges for you that like you now face with the 23s? Well, obviously, obviously that the, the the players are integrated more with with, with the first team. Uh, they train with the first team on a daily basis. Uh, as as a club as a whole, we've had a massive shift in in, in, in quality as regards to you know the first team going to Premier League and, and and the academy going Cat One. So so all of a sudden the quality of, of opposition has has, has gone up. Uh, so so that's a challenge as well. But you, you know, I'm, I'm working with a group of players who some are, who I've worked with for a long time, uh, right down from, from obviously Noan Kenner who was under 13, 14 playing playing in the 16s. So I've known a lot of the players for a long time, and, and some of the players who've just come in, you know, you know Sam Greenwoods, Cody Drama, uh, Joe Gelda. You know, I'm, I'm getting to know them uh, and, and getting to getting to know how they work and how I best can help, you know, in their development to push them on for the first team. In terms of getting to know players and knowing players, has that helped you kind of settled in more in the role that like you you know a large group of them, but also the philosophy as well? Has that changed? Has your philosophy from an under 18s manager how you want to play has that changed going to the 23s or is it quite close, closely knitted the two? Well, it's, it's you know the, the, the further down you go within 18s, it's, it's, it's development and, and things like that. But when when you step up to the 23s, obviously you know, it's still development and you're still working with young players who you've got to prepare and and get ready for the first team. But you know you 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 at the sharper end of it, where you know we, we need to establish these players and, and get them ready for for the manager to use because he's shown in his time at the club that. You know, he, he relies on the, uh, the the younger players to come through, and if if the players show the qualities uh, which he wants, then you know he's, he's not afraid to, to to progress them into the first team with the likes of Pascal Struik and Jamie Shackleton. You know, just 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 a few who've, who've, who've made the step up and uh, are consistently you know been involved with the first team squad. So. You know, we, we've got to prepare the players, but you know, it's at, it's at that sharp end now where we, uh, we, we have to get it right and we, we have to really, really push the players. In terms of that relationship with you and Marcelo Bielsa, has that actually become closer? Does it have to become that close because, like I said, the players integrate between the first team and the two and threes on a regular basis? But it's, it's great for me that, you know, the, the whole first team staff, the, the manager right down to his, to, to his staff as well, as, uh, have been fantastic. Uh, along with Jamie, who, who works with the first team as well, and he's kind of that link with the 23s. Alessandro, the goalkeeper coach, and obviously George Bell. All the staff have been have been played a massive part in, in kind of my transition up and helping. Like I said, it's about creating that that environment for the 23s, uh, which is which is close to the first team, and you know pulling everything together in a short space of time. Is, is, is has been difficult, but it's it's been it's been good and, and enjoyable and, and rewarding. You know, we're continuing with that now. Uh, you know, particularly over the international break as well. Without a league game coming up, we've we've got a chance to embed kind of that environment and that culture and how we work as a group. Uh, like again, to to ensure the players are ready to to to, to make that step up and we, we can get the best out of them. I think I've heard you say a couple of times, of course, this season so far, learning curves throughout the season. Yes, there's learning curves, but how much are you enjoying the, the journey so far, the campaign? It's, yeah, it's good. You know, it's, I, I, I enjoy working with players. I enjoy being on the training pitch. I enjoy interacting with, with individuals and, and the team and things like that. And 
the fact that you know I'm 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 close to the first team now, where you, you can see them work in real close quarters, and like I said, the, the the first team staff have been really open and they take a lot of interest in the 23s as regards to analysis and looking at players and speaking about players. You know, it's it's opened my eyes to how they work, and you know, it's developing me as a, as a coach as well of how I look at the game and how I see the game and and really how I analyse the game as well. So. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm developing myself and we're developing as a group of staff to, to obviously work towards the, the ultimate goal is, is getting the players ready. A final one, Jacko. Last time I spoke to you, mentioned a game of two-touch. You've still been working on that and, when, <laughs> and, when, and when's my challenge? Well, if you look over the shoulder there, there's the tech ball. So th th that's the next thing. So the boys have got the tech ball table there, which, which obviously the first team use and the 23s use. Uh, you, you can find the players on there and you know, I've not been beat that much on that so a game of one-on-one -on -one or 2v2 or two two will be uh, next on the agenda I think.